Now we need to prep the sky for rendering. So we've already done a little bit of the busy work earlier when we, you know, set up the floor and the backdrop and materials. So most of this is pretty much ready for rendering. We need to find one, a good angle, two, adjust a few settings, then we'll be good to go. So the important part about rendering is finding a good angle, right? Because, you know, certain angles like this, for example, this just doesn't make sense. But maybe an angle like this would make a little bit more sense, make it look big and intimidating, and uh, overall, just a lot better. So this is mostly subjective, but you want to make sure you find an angle that makes sense. You want to find an angle that makes it look menacing, um, very large, and has a good perspective. So usually what I do is I kind of pan around and just experiment, look at some different angles and see what I like. I already mostly have an idea of how I want this to look. It's going to be at an angle kind of like this. Now once you have an idea of where you want this to be positioned, in my case I want it to be, like I said, somewhere around here. All we have to do is add in a camera, and the camera is what's going to actually produce our render. So we're going to press Shift A and then go over to Camera. And if you press 0 on the number pad, this is um, how you get into camera view. And now by default, it might be under the floor or something weird. All you have to do to reset it is go up here to View, Align View, and then Align Active Camera to View. Now sometimes, depending on how I want this to look, I'll increase the focal length to get something a little bit more orthographic. Uh, if you guys are good at photography, uh, you know, you might have a better idea of how exactly you want to position things. I don't come from a strict photography background, but, you know, I've studied quite a bit in the photography space. I'm definitely not, you know, a seasoned photographer by any means, but, you know, I can get around with the focal length. So we'll go at something like 135 millimeters or so and really bring this back and, oops, press the wrong button. I'm going to grab it on the z-axis, local z-axis, and just kind of pull it back this way. We're going to get ourselves a nice little view somewhere around here. Let's rotate it downwards a bit. Move it back some more. Grab it on the local z. We want to make sure this guy is actually fitting in the frame here. And you can see that this focal length kind of makes it look a little bit more orthographic in the scene and just, um, you know, very nicely positioned. So we need to pull it back just a bit more to fit everything, not too much more, so just be careful with it. You know, around here should be okay. And then I'm going to pull it over to the right a little bit. We'll just grab the camera, move it over a bit. Have a little bit of empty space on the right, but not too much. And we can also go here to the output panel and click on render region, so that way it's only rendering what we see in this frame. Nothing else will be rendered, which also increases performance. So we're going to move this a bit more, and we want to make sure we get the floor as well as the backdrop to, you know, maximize the aesthetic of the render. I also want to make the floor a little bit more reflective, perhaps. Maybe we'll go in here, um, drop the base color a bit, and then make it more glossy, like that. And let me also scale this floor up a bit more. You can kind of see we have a triangle down here that isn't part of the floor. We'll just scale that up a bit to make sure it goes throughout the frame. And this is looking pretty good. Now I think we should also scale up the floor a bit more. It's kind of claustrophobic here in the back, a little bit too close to the foot in my opinion. And also we should move the backdrop backwards a bit. So first thing I'm going to do is take the floor and scale it up. And the more you kind of do these renders, the more you'll begin to feel comfortable with them. I mean, we're all still improving. I'm definitely still, um, you know, finding new tricks and techniques to make the renders look better. It's just a skill that you develop. So I'm going to scale up the floor a bit more like that, and then I'm also going to move the backdrop backwards. So grab it, press Shift Z, move it back to the corner, and then scale it up a bit. A little bit more maybe, like so. And I also don't really like how the back of the foot is perfectly angled with that floor. Let me scale it up a bit more until it's a little bit higher than the angle like that. I think it looks a bit cleaner that way. Let's also make sure the backdrop isn't intersecting. Scale this guy up. Pull it back a little bit more. And this looks much better. One other thing you could do is take this corner right here, go into edit mode and select this vertex. And you're gonna see that it looks like the vertex is here or so. Now we could actually rotate this guy 
let's do an edit mode. We could rotate this entire plane, position this vertex right in the middle somewhere, and then take it, take that vertex back here, and we could actually press Control Shift B and run a, um, a bevel here, right? And kind of get this more rounded. You won't notice too much of a difference, but I've actually um, found that it's a bit nicer, kind of gives it more of a curvy effect in the backdrop. And this is looking pretty good. We can also preview the whole thing by turning off the overlay panel, get a nice idea of how it looks. Maybe scale it up just a tad bit more, nothing crazy. Just a little bit, and this isn't too bad. Now I definitely think we should zoom the camera in just a little bit more. It looks good where it is, but it also looks like the bot's a little bit too tiny here. So let me turn the overlay panel back on. And I found that if you just select a random object in the scene, then select the border of the camera, it selects easily that way. What we can do is either adjust the focal length a bit. I would suggest just um, manually moving this in like so. Now that's too claustrophobic, move it back a bit. And maybe we can move down and then rotate it RXX, rotate it upwards like this. Now it's probably a bit too much. Just trying to get a nice little composition here. See what looks good. This is really all experimentation and trial and error. There is no chance you're gonna get a two minute good composition unless you get lucky. It simply takes all of us a long time and lots of practice and trial and error to get something that looks good. And if you want a good portfolio piece, you need to spend time rendering and getting a good angle. It's very important. So I think this is still a bit too close. Let me go back into top view and move it back a tad bit. I don't want it to be too claustrophobic. Maybe move it this way, like that. And it might also look a bit tiny because we're kind of zoomed out. If we zoom in a bit more, it'll probably look a little bit more intimidating. So this is definitely a lot better. We could also rotate this up a bit more, move it down. That's a bit too much now, isn't it? You gotta be careful that you don't start clipping with the floor, so you gotta find that nice middle ground and see what works. This is good for now. If we want to adjust this before the final render, obviously we can. What I'd like to do at this point is, first of all, the whole scene's a little bit too dim for my liking. What I'm gonna do is increase the HRI strength to around 1.2, and I would recommend not going much higher than that because if you go super high, like doubling the value, it looks way too bright and exposed. So 1.2 is about the max I would go. Any other exposure settings we can mess with in Photoshop during post-processing. We can also mess with some of the angles of the HRI. So let me go to Film and turn off Transparent so I can see where the lighting's coming from, right? So our angle's somewhere around here and the light's hitting it more from the back. You can kind of see it's coming this direction and hitting it in this area somewhere. So we're gonna try to actually rotate this HRI a little bit and see how that looks. So let me go up here, pull out the shader editor, go to the world tab, and all we're gonna do in here is just start rotating the HRI. And once again, if you don't have this mapping node, all you have to do is select, let me delete this, select this and press Control T, and that's going to turn on a mapping node for you. And at this point, you can just kinda go in here and adjust the rotation of the HRI. I think we mentioned that in another video, but uh, just to reiterate, that's how you do it. So control T, and if that still isn't working, make sure you have the, uh, what's it called, the Node Wrangler add-on enabled. It comes with Blender, just tick it on, save preferences, and you'll be good to go. Anyways, let's go back to the camera view and just start experimenting. So what I like to do is go in 45 degree increments and just see what works the best. So that's 45, this one is 90, you can see it's hitting more of this angle, but the whole mech is getting kind of dark now. You can try 135. Still looks awful. 180. 225. 225 isn't too bad, but it's hitting more at the left. 270. Too much on the left. 315. And back to zero. So I think zero is actually the best um, location for it because it's hitting the side very nicely but the front's also a little bit exposed. So it looks like zero on the rotation is gonna be the best bet here, so I'm gonna leave it alone. We'll just close, collapse that panel, 
And what we're going to do at this point is just adjust some more materials and get this thing ready for rendering. So first thing I like to do before I render is maybe adjust the backdrop a bit, see what looks good and what looks bad. So you could always go in here and you know adjust the roughness, increase the roughness, do whatever you want on that. Sometimes a little bit of clear coat looks pretty nice, but on rough surfaces it doesn't matter or make too much of a difference. On really glossy surfaces it'll pop a bit more. You can kind of see that there. Or maybe you can't. I don't know how the compression is going to look, but in this case, I'm just going to leave the roughness pretty high. The base color, I'm going to leave pretty exposed because if we go too low, the backdrop looks dark, but the whole entire mech is exposed. Doesn't make sense really. Good for seeing the nice contrast and how the light's hitting it, but not much more than that. So for base color, going to leave this at a nice rough white material. Now for the floor, this one's you know very ambiguous. You can do all sorts of things to the floor. You could drop the base color, make it even darker, but you're going to see that's going to really affect the bottom of the back. You can see how that's reflecting a lot of the uh, darkness of it onto the legs. You can see if I go really low, it looks awful, but if I go really high, then it becomes overexposed. So you want to make sure you find a good middle ground for that. Somewhere in the middle will be good. You can kind of adjust that. Just find a good middle ground for that. And then of course you can adjust the overall roughness. Now I would not recommend going high on the roughness, doesn't look very good. But also you don't want to go too low, otherwise it's going to be completely reflective, which is no good. So maybe somewhere around, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 to pick up the reflections, but also keep it a little bit rough. And like I said, sometimes clear coat gives a nice little effect and makes it have a little bit more depth in my opinion. But when I go on clear coat, I make sure to keep the clear coat value pretty low and if I do put it high I make sure to counteract that with a little bit of clear coat roughness. This one I honestly just slide around till it looks good. You don't have to do anything super technical but this is available to you if you want to adjust that. Now we already did a separate section on materials and I'm happy with how the materials look but if you want to adjust anything now is the time to do it because uh, materials are very important for your render and these materials are going to really pop especially once we add clarity and Photoshop. So make sure you're happy with all the materials on the mech. I'm pretty satisfied with how everything looks. Um, everything's pretty nice. This one I might give some metallic structure to it. You could leave it rough. I don't really think it matters too much. You know, just go around, see if there's anything you want to adjust. Overall, I'm happy with how this looks. So now there are a few things that need adjusting before we render. So we need to go to the rendering panel. And first thing you need to do is obviously make sure you're in cycles. I'm sure at this point you are in cycles, so make sure that is, you know, your go-to cycles looks really, really nice and gets the best reflections. Two, device. GPU compute if you have a good graphics card, or CPU compute if for um, whatever reason your CPU is quicker than your graphics card. Depends on your system, depends on your specs, I can't tell you. Uh, only you can decide on the best rendering option for you. In my case, I'm using my graphics card to render, so I'm going to click on that. Now the next one, a lot of people seem to overlook. People tend to really crank up the rendering samples, and I know because I was guilty of it um, long ago. And um, you don't need to go super high on the rendering samples. As a matter of fact, you only need a really low render amount, and the AI denoiser will pick up all the extra noise in the scene. I'll show you how to set that up shortly. Really all you need at most is like two to three hundred samples. I'm going to leave mine on 200. You could probably get away with like a hundred if not less to be honest. So um, I've had weird experiences with rendering in 2.9. Uh, if you guys have 2.83, I would suggest rendering in 2.83 at least for the time being. I don't know what it is, but I've had like issues where it renders quickly and issues where it says it's going to take an hour to render and I just, I don't know what the issue is. I think it's 2.9 itself. Anyways, 200 samples for rendering is fine. Now the next one is light paths. To be honest with you, I don't know all the super intricate technicalities behind uh, what the best true value is for light paths. I've found that these values tend to work the best. And you know, if you want to do some complex experimentation and see what affects your scene better, go for it. I've found that you really only need six samples, three diffuse, three glossy, um, for transparency, for transmission. Now, if you're using volumetrics, take this up to like one or two. We're not using any volumetrics, so I would recommend turning this off actually, just because it's not needed. 
Now for light clamping, you really don't need to mess with these, you can leave it on the default. I found that this actually tends to matter when you're doing more intense rendering scenes like photorealism and archivist or something like that. But for renders like this, I've never really found much of a difference when I adjust these values. At most, it might save you some render time um, fiddling with these, but not anything worth doing if I'm honest with you. And that's about it. Caustics you can leave on. I always leave those on. I don't see much of a need to turn them off. It hasn't really affected my render times. And obviously film, transparent, is always a good thing to have on. Although as long as you're not seeing the, the HDRI, it won't really matter. I just always have this on. And last thing, under tiles, if you're rendering with a GPU, you want to use a higher tile size, somewhere between 512 by 512 up to 2048 by 2048. And there's no set in stone answer for what the best one is. You simply have to go in and experiment and see which one produces the lowest amount of rendering times. And to be honest, I've noticed not much of a difference, maybe like 30 seconds at most, so it doesn't really matter. But a good middle ground value is 1024. Can't really go wrong with that. And finally, if you're rendering with a CPU, something like 16 by 16 would be good or 32 by 32, and at most 64 by 64. Once again, you need to experiment and see what produces the best results for you. Now, since I'm rendering with my GPU, I'm gonna use 1024 by 1024 and call it a day. Next, under color management, you can actually adjust the exposure and the gamma, basically the brightness and contrast. Now, I'm not gonna do this in Blender, I'm gonna do this in post-processing in Photoshop, but you can do it in here and also, you can still adjust these after the render is finished so you don't have to make that decision now. I'm not gonna mess with color management though. Next, all we need to do is go in here and make sure our resolution is set. So I render at 2560 by 1440, which is a 16 by nine aspect ratio. You can do just fine rendering at 1920 by 1080 though. This is more than fine, you just go in here. But if you want a little bit more resolution going on, I'd recommend doing 2560 by 1440, same aspect ratio, but just a little bit cleaner in my opinion. And make sure this percentage is turned up to 100, very important. If this is lower, say 50%, then you're only gonna get 50% of this rendering resolution. And it's just um, not in your best interest to make sure this is set to 100 at all times. Okay, next, you need to go over here to the output panel. Make sure you're in TIFF, RGBA, and 16-bit. 16 16-bit 16 TIFF is very, very important for quality. Now for compression, put this to none, otherwise you might get some lower quality compression and it just won't look that good. I haven't really noticed a difference, but I always put this to none just to uh, be in the safe zone. And finally, for note, I would recommend turning on note and then putting in your name here so that way the file basically stamps in your name with credit to you. We're almost done here. We need to go to the layers panel, turn on denoising data right here, very important. And now all we need to do is set up the denoiser and then we're ready to render. Setting up the denoiser is really easy. We just go up here to the compositor and you're gonna set yours up exactly like mine. So what you need to do is go up here and click on use nodes. You're gonna have this render layers panel and it's probably gonna be connected to a composite. As a matter of fact, it'll probably look something like this, right? So all you need to do is press shift A, go to filter and then go to denoise. Drop the denoise right here we're going to plug in noisy image to image, denoisy normal to normal, and then denoising albedo to the albedo. Now we just need to set up our glare node, and this is what gets us that nice bloom effect that you see in EV or look dev mode. So we're going to press shift A and then go to filter, glare, and we're going to drop the glare after the denoise node, change the streaks over to fog glow, and that's all you need to do. So now after the final render is done, you're going to get a nice bloom around any emissive areas. Once you're ready to render, we're going to go back to the 3D viewport. I'm going to take one last look, make sure everything is ready. There's not any noticeable errors in your scene. And of course, if you want to get multiple angles, you can render one and then, you know, do a different camera angle and just set this up however you want. But obviously, we just want to do one render um, just to get the idea down. So what we're going to do is go up here to render and click on render image. Now, I'd recommend doing this and solid view that way it's not you know buffering in cycles preview so we'll go to solid view 
It'll go up here to render or just press F12 and click on render image. And like I said, sometimes 2.9 gives this weird issue where the rendering times are just insane. Like this should not take you more, or at least me with my system, it should not take me more than a minute or two. So I found that if we just, first of all, close out this render and tweak the samples a bit, it'll actually fix itself. What I think 2.9 is doing, and I haven't really found a set solution, and I, I just think this is the case by inspection. So in earlier versions, like 2.79, 2.8, whatever, uh, the rendering samples were the true amount of samples, but now we have this thing called total samples, and it, like, it has like a scalar multiple of some sort. Anyways, I found that we want to get this guy to around 200 rather than in here to around 200. And sometimes this appears, sometimes it doesn't. Honestly, no clue why. I don't know if it's a bug, maybe it depends on the scene. But this is why I'm probably going to go back to 2.83 until this is fixed. I don't like this issue. So we need to try something like 14. And that's going to get us basically the 200 samples we're going for. So you just have to tweak this and hopefully it'll render just fine this time and I found this is like the only fix instead of having to go back to an earlier version. So if you have that issue, drop the render and I believe this is the true sample count and this is not. And now you're going to see this is much better. We have about a minute remaining for the render time. It might be a little bit longer just until it finishes calculating. And this actually brings up a really good point that I'm, I'm glad popped up because this happens a lot in my renders. You're going to see it's rendering very strangely. As a matter of fact, it's rendering pieces that are hidden in the viewport but are not hidden in uh, rendered view. And let me show you how to fix this. I'll wait for this to finish up. So you're going to see that on this mech we have a bunch of overlapping issues and it just looks terrible. And the reason this is happening is because some areas disabled in the viewport were not actually disabled in our rendering setting. So what we need to do is first of all make sure the cutters collection, let's find the cutters collection We'll go in here and we're going to go to this panel, turn on the camera for rendering settings. We're going to make sure this is turned off for cutters, which it is. And we also need to make sure every single thing that's hidden in the scene is also hidden in render. So we need to turn off the camera icon. This is most likely a result of our backup layer. You're going to see that in the backup layer, most of these are turned off in the viewport, but are not turned off for rendered view. So it's rendering all the backup pieces and hence giving us an overlap in the final render. So I believe we can just turn off the camera for the entire collection and it'll do the same thing for everything else. I haven't had any issues with that as of yet, so you don't have to go through each one manually and turn that off, which is good. We're going to also check for any other stray pieces we may have missed. We'll just go in here, make sure any hidden objects are also hidden in rendered view, which most of them are. Some of these are missed. We'll just turn these off just to be safe. And yeah, now we should be good to go for the render. And already you can tell that fixed the issue completely, so I've had a lot of people message me about this problem in other courses, so just make sure you hide your backup collection and hide any other object that is not visible in the viewport from renders as well. Very easy fix, um, very common issue as well, and that's how you can fix it. So here's the final render, which of course we're going to clean up and make look better in Photoshop, but this is how yours should look. You should have uh, you know, not really any noise in the scene. Your rendering time shouldn't be that long. Mine took about a minute and 38 seconds on my RTX 2070. And depending on your system, it'll be quicker or maybe a bit slower, but still it shouldn't be that long. Now what we need to do is go up here to image, click on save as, and then save this as whatever name you want.